Good morning, High Rock. I'm Dave, one of the pastors here, and I'm glad we get to open the scriptures together. You know, when kids are about three, they learn to speak in full sentences, but the sentence they love most only has one word. Why? No matter what you say, they ask, why? Hey, kiddo, time to read books. Why? Uh, because it's almost bedtime. Why? Because going to bed on time helps keeps us healthy and feeling good. Why? Uh, because otherwise it'll mess with your circadian rhythms and melatonin production that God gave to help us sleep. Why? Uh, well, because God loves you very much but apparently wanted us to keep quiet for about eight hours a day. Why? You know, suddenly I know the answer to that, but I'll just keep it to myself. You know, it can be a bit annoying as a parent being asked why 900 times each day before breakfast, but it's actually a beautiful stage when kids are learning so quickly and discovering God's world, including relationships, physics, and the mysterious connections between cause and effect. Kids use questions to engage the world more deeply, but adults rarely ask questions. We prefer to give answers. We prefer others think that we already know everything important, we don't like to admit how much we still don't understand or how confused we often feel. So we still have lots of questions, but most of us are afraid of looking ignorant, foolish, childlike by asking questions. So we mostly keep those questions to ourselves. But then along comes Jesus asking lots of interesting questions. It's odd, really, because being God, he could have given us all the answers, but the right answer makes no sense if you're asking the wrong questions. Hey, can you tell me how to get to Worcester? E equals MC squared. Right, thanks for that. It may be a brilliant answer, but to a very different question. It's been said that a good teacher gives good answers, but a great teacher asks great questions. So Jesus wasn't afraid to ask questions the way some of us are, different questions than we usually ask, the right questions, the questions that might actually lead us to the answers we need. And not just a few questions, Jesus asked 307 of them, or at least that's how many were recorded. Who knows how many more there might have been? But people remembered these questions and wrote them down because Jesus was asking new questions, different questions, unsettling questions that made us question all the answers we thought we already knew. And yet Jesus' questions can help us find the life and truth and fullness we all long for. They're the right questions. But we need the courage and wisdom and audacity to ask them. Maybe this is one reason Jesus insisted, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Kids don't mind asking. Even if it takes 100 times, they're not embarrassed to admit they don't know. Usually, we open the Bible in search of answers. But starting today and all through the summer, we're going to be looking at the questions Jesus asked and letting him ask those questions of us. Because asking the right questions may finally help us find the answers we were always looking for. And appropriately, I'll begin with a question of my own. Have you ever walked into a room you know, to get something and suddenly 
forgotten what you were looking for? You, you try to retrace your steps, you're hoping that something's going to jog your memory. I hate it when that happens because it makes me feel like an idiot and, and I never end up getting what I needed because I know how, no idea what it is anymore. Or perhaps you recognize this. Have you ever stood in front of the fridge, door open, just staring? Because you know that you're hungry, but you have no idea what to eat. I don't want that. I had that yesterday. Maybe I, I want that. What else is there? If you don't know what you're looking for, then you probably won't find it. We know that from staring at the fridge, and we find it so frustrating. And yet, that's what most of us do with life. We spend so much time, effort, energy, and money trying to get what we wanted. The right job, the right spouse, the right income, the right friends, the right lifestyle or possessions. But somewhere along the way, we realize that we still don't have what we really want. So we try harder, we work more, we get another degree, or, or, or we try something else. We, we switch jobs, or spouses, or lifestyles, or cities, to no avail. Because the real reason we can't find what we really want is that most of us don't know what that is yet. We aren't sure what we're looking for. So Jesus' first words in the Gospel of John are a question. What do you want? Well, this question may sound simple. It, it may sound silly. It's the kind of question that we talk about all the time. It sounds to me like James Corden and Adele don't really know quite what they want. But Jesus is pushing us a bit deeper. To appreciate his question, let me give you the context. Two guys who'd been following John the Baptist kept hearing him talk about someone else, the, the Messiah, God's own son. And not in the one day far away kind of way, but in, in a, a right now, very near you kind of way. And then one afternoon, as Jesus approached John, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What? Well, that got everyone's attention. So two of the men following John the Baptist started following Jesus instead. I mean, why listen to the Super Bowl on the radio if you have the chance to go there live and see it yourself? Likewise, why listen to John the Baptist rave about Jesus if you can just listen to Jesus directly? So Andrew and John decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus' first words were not to welcome them or to thank them for giving him a try. They weren't congratulations that they'd chosen so wisely or instructions about how this relationship would work. No, his first words were a question. What do you want? It wasn't, what do you want? As if Jesus wasn't sure they deserved to be his disciples. No, it was a deeper question, more powerful and profound, more personal. Before we go any further, we need to be clear about what we're doing here so that you're not disappointed by reality and so that you don't run off and follow the next exciting rabbi that walks by. I, I want you to clarify what you're looking for in me. So Jesus looks them in the eye and asks a question that most of us are too busy, distracted, or afraid to ask ourselves. In your heart of hearts, at the center of your soul, what do you want? Why are Andrew and John following Jesus? Are they looking for a Superman, like we talked about last week, who could protect them from any pain and make all of their dreams come true? Are they looking for a celebrity whose coattails they could ride to worldwide fame? Are they looking for a warrior who'd beat up all their enemies? Are they looking for an insurance policy, a backup plan, 
access to God's help in case their own power doesn't turn out to be enough. What do you want? But Jesus' question goes even deeper, down to the core of their being. It's the essential question that all of us need to ask, but usually avoid asking because we're afraid of the answer. Afraid that we'll be disappointed by our inability to get what we really want. Afraid we'll be disgusted by the person our desires reveal we really are. Afraid we'll disappoint other people if we don't do what they want. By the time we're adults, most of us have learned not to ask that question very deeply. We gratify our most superficial desires as a way of silencing the longings of our souls. But what do you want? And though it may be uncomfortable, if you're willing to come with me, today I want to ask you a simple but essential, maybe even a dangerous question. What do you want? Now, I, I realize this is getting a little deep, especially if you're in the middle of college finals or just got back from school vacation week. So let's start, our, start off with the easiest layer of that question. Why are you here today in church? What were you looking for? Why did you join a small group, a ministry, listen to the scriptures or sermons? Why do you sing praise songs? What do you want? Like walking into a room and forgetting why we came, many of us come to church and we go through the motions without clarifying what we were hoping to find here, which means we'll probably not find it even if it's here. What do you want? Were you looking for comfort? That everything is under control, despite all the chaos in the world, or the chaos in your life, or your family? I mean, it's really not all that bad, be because it's all part of God's perfect plan. It, is that what you were hoping to hear? Were you looking for affirmation? That what you think is right, or, or whatever you've chosen, is the best thing that could have been? That I'm great, just the way that I am. You know, other people are trouble. It's their fault. But I don't need to repent or grow at all. Were you looking for relief? An escape from all of your problems or pain? Your broken marriage, a broken friendship, a broken family, a broken heart? A way to run away from your responsibilities or regrets? Were you looking for God's supernatural power to control your circumstances, cure your disease, ensure your success, or make the world work the way you want it to? Comfort, affirmation, relief, and control. Subconsciously, that's what a lot of people expect God to give them, which is why they come to church. But then they're disappointed when they don't always find those things. And they get angry at the church or God for not keeping the promises that he never made. So at the very first moment, Jesus asks Andrew and John, what do you want? Friends, can I ask you today, what do you want? Why are you here? What were you hoping to find? Take a moment to consider that. We could spend more time with that question, but Jesus is probing even deeper. He's not just asking about our Sundays and our spirituality. He's asking about our souls. What do you want? What motivates you? What do you dream of? What's your ultimate goal? To be happy? To be safe? To be smart? To be approved of? To be loved? to be beautiful, to be popular, to be wealthy, to be admired, to feel good, to be left alone. Do you want to own a big house, own a nice car, or your own company? Get married, 
have a big family, or lots of friends, or lots of fun, take lots of trips, make lots of money, become president, retire at 55. What do you want? My experience after being a pastor for 20 years is that most of us don't know. Three years ago, someone I grew up with called me. Now he's a big executive in high finance and makes more money than I can imagine. What began as a simple hello, sir, soon turned into much more. As we were bantering, I asked casually, how are you doing? And he gave me the usual platitudes, but not like he meant it. His heart wasn't in it. And then he paused. I don't think I'm doing all that well. So I replied, tell me about that. Over the next 90 minutes, he retraced his life sports star, Ivy League, boutique firms, beautiful family. He's been so successful. But he suddenly realized recently that all his life, people kept painting targets for him. And he'd hit them, and everybody would applaud and assure him he was on the right path. And he was sure they must be right, even though the glow of each victory didn't last very long. But they promised that true contentment and, and, and real joy was just over that hill, just around the next bend. And every time he got there, they'd point out just one more hill he needed to climb. But by the time he called me, he'd conquered enough of those mountains to stop believing those people anymore. While he talked, he came to the discovery that he'd spent his whole life accomplishing other people's goals, but never discerning what his own should be. Who had God made him? Why had God made him? What was he supposed to do? He never really asked those questions, in part because he was too busy. Anyway, making more money and getting more authority always seemed like it would be enough because everyone else said it would be. All along, he thought he was succeeding, but finally he realized, no, this is how they'd made him their slave. After listening to all that, I asked him a very simple question that he'd never asked before. What do you want? And not, what is the world telling you to want? What does your soul want? What do you truly long for? More than another car, another vacation, another victory, even another child. What would satisfy your soul? He didn't know. He'd never really asked that question before. All he knew for sure is that it wasn't what he had. And he had everything. Can you relate to any of that? Do you know what you really want? And as Christians, is that even a question we should ask? You know, there's a popular misconception that following Jesus requires dying to yourself, which should mean that it no longer matters what you want. The only thing you should care about anymore is what God wants. Besides that, we're all so sinful that most of what we want is sinful. So the last thing you should want is to do what you want. And yet Jesus begins his relationship with Andrew and John by questioning, what do you want? And that should give us a hint that we've been a bit too binary about desire, that it's either good or evil. The fact is that God gave us desires. He wove them right into us when he knit us together. God created us to crave him. Let me explain. God created us with free will and then let us loose but he designed desire to keep us magnetically coming back to him and, and to push us to fulfill the purposes for which he created us. That's why every society in the history of humanity has been religious, because there's something programmed into our DNA that longs for God. In the fourth century, Augustine, who tried every other indulgence and possibility, finally realized, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. He converted to Christianity and became one of the great saints. In the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, the math genius who invented calculus and ultimately the computer, explained that we'd been created by God with a God-shaped 
hole in our hearts that can only be filled by returning to God himself. Nothing else will satisfy. Recently, researchers at the National Institutes of Health thought they were being controversial and avant-garde to claim that humans are wired for spirituality. It's built right into our biology. But of course, this is what theologians have been saying for centuries. The Lord is full of love and passion, and He pours little pieces of His passion into each of us so that each of us will care about some of the things that He cares about. And together, we can do His will on earth as it is in heaven. Our respective passions for justice, peace, intimacy, beauty, community, care for creation, procreation, fighting evil, fighting for the poor, or the elderly, all reflect God's desires. And those are good. They propel us to do God's work in the world. The problem is not our desire. It's sin, which distorts those desires so they become self-centered and twisted. My desire for justice gets twisted into a desire for revenge. My desire for intimacy gets twisted into a desire for pornography. My desire for order gets twisted into demand for control. My desire for beauty gets distorted into indulgence. My desire for community gets twisted into cliquishness. My desire for an encounter with God on Sunday erodes into a demand for entertainment. My longing for God gets warped into worship of things that aren't worthy of it, status, sex, money, popularity, family, even righteousness, anything we put above God thinking that somehow it can satisfy our souls. But there's a maxim that became famous because it's so true. Every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is actually looking for God. C.S. Lewis explained it this way, quote, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased." End quote. Pleasure. Popularity possessions. We stuff them into our souls to fill the hunger we feel, but they'll never be enough. God, His call for you, those are the only things that will ever satisfy. The problem is not that we want too much. It's that sin has got us so twisted around and confused that we no longer know what we really want. We just know that we want something something different or more than whatever we already have. And this snowballing uh, spiritual emptiness is what has made us such easy prey for marketers. They appeal to that hole in your soul like they truly understand because they do. They feel it too. But then they manipulate you for profit by promising to fill that hole with things you can buy a Mercedes, a mansion, or more commonly, a pair of Beats or Yeezys, a fancy meal. They know it won't work. You'll be hungry again right afterwards, which is perfect, because then they can sell you something else. Now, our friends, spouses, employers, parents, professors, even our pastors can do the very same thing, exploiting the hunger in our souls to make us chase things that actually benefit only them. We're easy marks because we don't know what we want. We know what we've been told to want by the endless advertisements we've heard and seen, but we don't know what our souls are thirsting for. So Jesus asks, what do you want? It's a good question, but as we've seen, not necessarily a simple one. If our desires have been distorted, then how can we figure out what we truly want? Actually, I have some experience with this. 
Ten years ago, I started wrestling with Jesus' question. What do I want? Maybe it was an early midlife crisis, but I, I was feeling a bit lost after accomplishing some of my dreams and yet still feeling mysteriously empty. So I committed to spending 20 minutes a day in silence with God for a month. During that time, I journal the answer to six questions that I assembled from the Desert Fathers and the ancient saints as they grappled with Jesus' question. The six questions were, What do I feel? What do I want? Is that what I really want? What do I fear? Is that fear real? And only during the final week of the month, what is God inviting me to do with all this? The ancients made this process seem difficult, but I found it easy because the very first day I already knew all the answers. What do I feel? Tired, trapped, lonely, unfulfilled, hopeless. What do I want? Well, it was springtime and I was sitting by Lower Mystic Lake and the answer was immediately clear. I wanted a boat. I imagined my son and his best friend and his best friend's dad, who was probably my best friend at the time, all flying across the lake in my powerboat. As we laughed ridiculously, we'd follow the Mystic River into the Boston Harbor and we'd feel the sunshine on our faces and the wind in our hair. Well, is that what I really want? Yeah. What do I fear? Not getting the boat. Is that fear real? Probably, because I can't afford to buy a boat. You know, I had it all figured out. And if I'd not learned from the ancients that I couldn't act on any of this for a month, I probably would have gone boat and bank loan shopping that afternoon. It was helpful to identify that, but I had 29 days left to do this. So the second day, I started a new page in my journal and I asked the same questions. What do I want? A boat. I, all my answers were the same. And the third day. And a few more. That's really what I wanted. So I spent a lot of that 20 minutes each day savoring my fantasy and perfecting the details. In, in another, another 25 days, I'd have to convince my wife that God had told me to buy a boat. Hey, it, it worked for Noah. The only thing that changed over those days was that I became more articulate about my fears. What was I afraid of? That people would think that I was greedy to waste money on a boat. That people would think I was lazy to waste time in a boat. And soon I realized that I was afraid that I would think that too. My wants never changed, but my guilt and shame and people-pleasing and need to perform were slowly coming to the surface. But after about a week, as I was going through this exercise yet again, a strange realization suddenly struck me. I have a boat. Well, not really me, but my dad owns a powerboat on a lake and he's given me permission to use it anytime I want. But I almost never do. Even when I'm at the lake, I almost never use the boat. That's weird. Why is that? The next day, when I answered what I want, I still wrote, a boat. But under the question, is that what I really want? I wrote, I'm not so sure. It wasn't until the third week that I finally discovered that I didn't want a boat. That was just a superficial symbol of my real desire. I wanted time off. I was a workaholic at the time because I was driven by the fear of letting people down, of not doing enough. So I hadn't ever taken a Sunday off since we'd started High Rock six years earlier. Actually, I'd only taken off a handful of any days during that time. And I wasn't spending enough time with God anymore or the people close to me, which was making my soul shrivel. I was exhausted. I was overextended, and my soul longed for rest. And I wanted relationships. My son was growing up, but I was at work. 
I wanted time with him and with my wife and friends. I wanted to be close to people, but I lacked the time and, frankly, the skills to do that very well. And I wanted to enjoy God's creation. Sunshine and water represented the beauty I wanted to soak in. I wanted joy, symbolized by our laughter. And I wanted freedom. You know, I felt like a slave at my job, always having to meet everybody's expectations and work like a dog, but I'm the boss. I'm the one making this unhealthy schedule. I was doing this. I didn't want a boat. I wanted a life. Instead of working all of the time to allay my fears of being rejected or found inadequate, I had to trust that God had made me in a way that was beautiful and good so I could enjoy God's world rather than being afraid all the time. And once I realized that, my, joy, my desire for a boat faded away. I tell you this story because I've discovered since that I'm not alone. I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. You too released a song that rocketed to number one because it was the quiet cry that we all recognize. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Most people can't find what they want because they don't know what they're looking for. Why? Because most people don't really want what they think they want. They just want it because society and people with something to sell told them that they should want it. Like standing in front of the open refrigerator late at night. What are we looking for? Comfort? Satisfaction? distraction from all of our nagging thoughts. Many of us spend our lives like that, with these indistinct longings that we don't know how to satisfy. We yearn for something, but we aren't sure what. We try a bit of this and then that, but nothing's enough. You can never get enough of something that doesn't satisfy. What do you want? What did our Creator create you to crave so that you'd serve Him in that special way? What do you want? Maybe you don't really want to get a master's degree. Maybe you don't really want to get married. Maybe you don't really want to make more money. Maybe you want to make a difference, but you never knew how much you wanted that. Maybe you don't really want fame, popularity, another boyfriend, another one-night stand. You want the intimacy that comes from truly loving another sinner and being honest with them. After a lifetime of wealth and power in Pharaoh's household, Moses realized that he didn't really want those things as much as he wanted to know God and experience His blessings. What do you want? Augustine advised, quote, Love God? and then do whatever pleases you. Now, he didn't mean that so long as we love God, we can indulge all of our sinful desires. No, he meant that as our souls get refilled with the Spirit of God, we discover what we really want, what we are created to want. All of our other desires start to become less distorted. We can see clearly again. We can begin to trust our desires again. As Soren Kierkegaard remarked, quote, Now, with God's help, I shall finally become myself. End quote. Or as David said it in Psalm 37, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Not the superficial, distorted, often destructive desires our society tries to sell us. No, our deepest desires that were given to us by God that will propel us to do God's work in the world. Serving the poor, protecting the weak, welcoming the stranger, using our gifts to bless others, often through our jobs. Loving sinners, including your spouse, children, co-workers, or classmates, even your pastor. Love God. And then do whatever pleases you. So, can I tell you what I want? I want you to discover 
what you want, what you really want, what God created you to want. I want you to finally become your true self. Starting this week or sometime this summer, I encourage you to set aside 20 minutes a day for a month to listen to God and answer Jesus' question. What do you want? You can see my six guiding questions on the screen, and they'll also be available by tomorrow on the High Rock app, along with all the scriptures from today's sermon. And even if you think you know the answer right away, stick with it. Perhaps, as I often do, you'll discover beneath your superficial desires something deeper, spiritual desires that can truly satisfy. And finally, I encourage you, every time you come to church or go to small group or open the scriptures for personal reading and prayer, begin with Jesus' question to Andrew and John. What do you want? What are you looking for? For a Santa Claus to give you gifts the other 364 days? To be assured that you're right? To be entertained? Or to be challenged? to reconnect with the living God and worship Him so that you can see Him and serve Him in daily life. I want you to do this because like staring at the open fridge late at night, if you don't know what you want, you'll probably never find it, even if it's right in front of you. What do you want?